I'm born and raised in Hilo. I went to school a uh, couple of Heights on Oahu at Kamehameha. But I went away for college to the east coast of the United States, to a very urban portion of Philadelphia. And to be really honest, uh, I struggled. I, mean, I could even say I might have hated it to some degree. It was just really challenging for me. And at the end of a particularly hard week, um, I was feeling kind of low. And I did what I often did. I went to play basketball, something I loved to do. And I got hurt, hurt my, my left knee pretty bad. Not the kind of hurt that you have to go to the hospital, but you know, it was swollen, painful. Went back to my dorm room, crawled into bed, and wanted to come home. I felt so disconnected to my aina, to my kupuna, to the values that I was taught as a young man. And it was so painful, um, I couldn't sleep really well, and I got out of bed about 7 a.m. And shortly after I got out of bed, the phone rang, and it was my dad. But there's two real odd things about this. The first is, everyone knows, you don't call a college student at 7 a.m. on Saturday morning, right? The other odd thing was, I knew it was 2 a.m. at home. Well, why is my dad calling me at 2 a.m.? So we chit-chatted. So finally I said, Dad, what are you doing up at 2 a.m.? And he paused and he said, Son, how's your left leg? Now, how many of you have had an experience like that with a parent or a sibling or a close friend? I see a lot of hands and heads. And what really struck me about that, it's not that that was new. I've had those kind of experiences, particularly with him. What really struck me was that it was still there when I was so far away from home that he knew and he could feel me. And um, for all of the younger folks in the crowd, this is pre-Facebook and Twitter. He, I didn't put it up on my Facebook page and he saw it. This is pre-internet, pre-email, pre-cell phone. That's how old I am, crazy. He knew from here. And I was out of school actually, invented the computer. We were cutting edge of the internet and we were all jazzed because we were sending files over our phone lines. Despite all of that remarkable Technology, it didn't even come close to what my dad had. And today I want to talk a little bit about that, which I'm calling today Native Intelligence, only because I believe we talk about it too much in these mystical forms, and the reality is it is a source of knowledge that will help us move forward in our lives, help us make great decisions if we will just honor it. I'm not going to talk too much about what that is or the spiritual aspects, because that's not my expertise, and there's people in this audience that are much more astute than I about it. What I want to talk to you about it in relation to my work with communities and organizations and particularly students uh, over the last couple of decades and how do I talk to them about this very important and um, vital force within them. To do that, I want to talk first about a simple framework that I've been using with kids for a while. It's not going to be news to any of you and it's really talking about physical, mental, and emotional well-being helping students kind of develop all aspects of themselves. The problem I've had with kids is they don't really want to have a conversation about well-being. They think they're invincible, they think they know everything, and their emotional capacity is whatever Beyonce said in her last song, okay? So I had to kind of like change the topic. I, I knew from my own kids and working with kids for a while that kids really want to be attractive. They want to be desirable. So I started talking to kids about that. Say, do you want to be attractive? Now, some kids will say, absolutely, tell me how to do that, right? Most of them act like they don't really care, but you can tell they're listening, right? So I explained to them, if you want to be attractive, you need to be mentally, physically, and emotionally healthy. Think about it for a second. Think about those people that you're really drawn to, that you want to be with, right? Maybe you know only a little bit, but you want to get to know them better. I guarantee you, if you look at it, they're very strong in at least two of these three categories. Okay? The beauty of this with young people is that we start talking about things they can control. I can control where I'm healthy in these areas. And if it's true that doing that makes me attractive, I can be desirable 
by working on my health. All of a sudden, we're having a well-being conversation, and they don't even know it, right? One of the ways um, that I've helped people understand this is we all have known of a person we, we saw, and we thought, wow, that person is really good looking. Wow, you know, they think they're lovely to get to know them better, and then you meet them, and you're like, oh my gosh, this person is so dull. They have no emotional capacity at all, and all of a sudden, they're not that good looking anymore, right? And we've had the opposite experience. We met someone, and you know, we're not particularly physically drawn to them, but the more we know them, how, how bright the conversations are, how they make us feel inside. All of a sudden, we're just tremendously attracted to them, right? And I think that that allows us to have this conversation about what I was talking about with my dad, right? Once we understand about creating this container of well-being for ourselves, we can start talking about what we fill ourselves up with, right? That passion, that drive, right? that inner source of mana or energy that, we, that people call different things all over the world, we know exists, but we're so uncomfortable talking about, particularly in places like schools. Because when we tap in to that force, and when we help students tap into that force, they are unstoppable, right? They do incredible things, and we all know that. And it's really important to me because I don't believe we're gonna get students that are making a better world or, or even creating happiness for themselves by helping them reach the standards, all right? I think standards are important, but that's not the secret to quality education. It's helping kids connect with that inner spirit inside of themselves. And it's critical for our world because the difference between a person who has skills and, and well-being versus a person who's filled up is the difference between devising incredible treatments for cancer and curing cancer. Right? Our greatest challenges and opportunities lie in tying into this powerful intelligence within each of us. So, you know, I kind of thought to myself, pretty simple, help kids get, you know, this framework of well-being, help them connect with where they come from, they're going to fill themselves up, and boom, right, things are going to be better. Kids will be happy, they're graduating, having great lives, but there's a problem. And really, what I learned is that I had to help students make the connection between the physical well-being and that energy within them, all right? I'll go back one slide. Because for me, that the source, right, of this internal energy that my dad could tap into, it's like a fountain that everybody has, right? It's not in some, but not others. We all have it, right? But some of us have it turned on, some of us don't. With kids, what I, what I learned was, even if I get it turned on, if we don't manage the, the well-being aspects, right, it starts to leak out. So, for example, if a student is not expanding their mind, learning new things, right, working their intellect, it starts to get a little thin, and some of that energy starts to leak out, right? Emotionally. If they don't learn how to manage tough situations, they're very reactionary, right? Chasing after the gossip that's going on in school. A little bit more of that energy leaks out. Physically, we don't take care of ourselves. We allow disease to enter our bodies. Even more energy leaks out. And this may seem like a simple concept, but I found it critical with especially communities in need and, and people in need to draw these parallels. That we can look at the, any hardship going on in your life and we can find out what's going on with you as a person and in your life that's allowing this life force that has the answers to your problem to dissipate. Until, before we know it, we go from these very healthy, capable people with lots of power to really these shells of who we're, we could be and what's possible. This is where I'm at in life. You know, like many of you, I get up early, I'm getting to work, I'm trying to save kids in communities, I'm getting home late, I'm not eating well, I'm not exercising. And having to stop here and say to myself, am I gonna invest in this container? Am I gonna tap into my fountain so that I can be all that I can be, right? And that's something I think each of us who do this kind of work need to stop and always assess for ourselves. This is a picture of my wife and I. Um, hi, Annie, she's in the audience. Uh, this is 
at Hapaya Li'iheao in Kalu'u. We both have connections to that place. But I'm showing it because of the tattoos you see there on our hands. Those are our wedding bands. Uh, we didn't really want rings, and we didn't want to tattoo our ring finger, so we did that. That's Sanskrit for Namaste, one of the most ancient languages in the world. And for us, it's very similar to what Aloha means. And we explain to people, for us, it's the spirit in me recognizes and honors the spirit in you. And the reason I'm showing this slide, we, we felt like that was the basis for a quality marriage. But it was also the basis for quality relationships with all people. And we wanted it there in our hands because when we hold hands, they're lined up. If you shake someone's hand, we see it, right? It was a constant reminder for us to live that kind of life. And in the context of native intelligence, I'm sharing it because I really believe the purpose of being a healthy, vibrant, full person is to make these kind of connections with other people who have a similar belief, similar energy. Because really, uh, no one individual makes much difference at all. They may be the spark plug for a difference, but unless they're able to connect with others who carry their message forward, who repeat what they believe and do, they will only be, have limited success. It's by creating these kind of healthy communities, right, of full people, healthy schools, healthy churches, healthy homes and families, that we really are able to tackle the challenges that face us as a community. And so, one of the keys to honoring Native intelligence is creating places where that kind of interaction occurs, where you can be struggling, you're dealing with crisis, a loss of a loved one, a disease, and you can be in a community that surrounds you with love and aloha and nurturing and allows you to start to heal yourself, right? Rebuild the person that you know you can be. And in schools, working now, I really believe this is at the heart of everything. Everything we do, any academic intervention, any social intervention, comes back to creating this kind of environment where students can heal and fill themselves up and be the best person they can be. I want to talk a little bit about, for my own self and in my philosophy, where the source of that energy comes from. And uh, this is something my wife sent to me uh, at a time I was really needing some guidance, right? Just as a reminder of what I already know. That that source of energy for me is simply getting quiet and talking to my kupuna and asking for their help. And if I do and if I listen, they will always answer. Not always what I might want to hear, right? But they will always answer and they're always there. When um, my dad passed away, um, many years ago, it was really a challenging time for me. And I'm the oldest in my generation, I had to hold it together, we had to do all the services, and I just, well, I was struggling. And we had his, his funeral, and a thousand people came to my dad's funeral. My dad was not a powerful man or a famous man, he was a ticket agent at the airlines for 30 years, right? But my dad lived these concepts. The same way that he connected with me when I was in college in the East Coast, he connected with every person he came across. He felt them and he gave them aloha. And there were people of every ethnicity, every economic background from all places of the country that felt that. And so, for me, that lesson, right, the simplicity of that, you know, um, has really resonated for me and carried forward into the work that I've done. The, the closing thoughts that I want to talk about have to do with something else that happened at my dad's funeral. One of my closest friends, Dr. Guy Kuulukukui, who many of you know, um, we're from Hilo, so the funeral is in Hilo, he's from Oahu. He flew in the morning of the funeral, even though he had an afternoon appointment, he flew in for two hours just to come to the funeral. It meant a lot to me. And when he was going through the line, he gave me a piece of paper. And on it, it said, we can never repay our parents for all they've done for us. We can only do better for our own children. 
I had that note taped to my mirror for two years, helping me every day remember that the key to being connected to this life force and staying connected to my dad was being connected to my boy. This is my oldest son, who's now in college in Oregon, and I had three kids since then, right? And that's how I can tap into that fountain of energy for myself and my family. How I can honor my dad is really by honoring my kids. And then I understood it's not just my own kids, but it's the kids I'm servicing in school, some of whom don't have parents like I had, right? Helping be a, a, a nurturing place for them. I was very proud, and it was kind of a, you know, no coincidence in life. Uh, my son is in Oregon, and he's a coach of a, a girls basketball team, varsity basketball team in Oregon. He's only 20, and he got this job, and I was wondering how he got it, and he showed me how. Last night was senior night for those, his team. And last week, he called me, and he said, Dad, do you think you can help us out? I want to I wanna do lays at senior night in Oregon, right? I want to bring that tradition from Hawaii to Oregon. And to be honest, my first reaction was, you know how busy I am? You know how hard it's going to be for me to hustle up lays? You know how expensive it's going to be to get lays up to Oregon? Right? But, you know, I did it. Right? And after I sent it, I started to think about what that experience is going to be like. Right? And last night, getting ready for this, I talked to him a little bit about that, and it was all there. Right? Those, that community and those girls got to practice something that we do effortlessly in Hawaii, right? And that community got to see that my son and his ohana were willing to send fresh flowers thousands of miles for that event, an event that honored the spirit in these girls and the connection that they have with their families. And I like to think that that model resonates with everybody who was in that gym. And not in explicit ways like this, but in ways unseen and unheard, the lessons that my dad taught me get passed on beyond physical boundaries, beyond familial boundaries, but just as a positive way to live life. Uh, thank you for your time today. I'm so excited to be able to now enjoy all the speakers <laughs> and be in the audience. And I thank you for all the work you do. Aloha.